Thank you so much for coming. My name is Bea, and I'm the Senior Community Events Manager for PixArt. We are a photo editing and drawing app um, that facilitates creativity um, and just allows people to do pretty incredible things with um, their cell phones. Um, because of my work at PixArt, and I also have a background in arts uh, nonprofit, I, oh, I'm always really curious about that intersection between arts and technology, and especially right now as you know, more tech companies move into the city, um, and there's kind of like this weird uh, vilification of tech and also sort of like, a, um, oh my god, they're, they're simulating the economy, they're amazing kind of dynamic going on. I feel like it's really timely to talk to people that have experience working with both technology and in the arts and to talk a little bit about how you can, you know, use technology companies for your advantage if you're an artist. Um, so I'll let everyone introduce themselves. This is um, Jordan Gray and Bruno Fonsi from Kodame. Um, Ian Smith Heisters um, and Adam Fong from the Center for New Music. So I'd love for you guys to start just talking a bit about yourself and uh, what you're doing. Sure. Um, I've been doing digital art and publishing media for 20 years. I started out doing manga things like that and just playing with computers and them being a natural place for me to express myself. So to be part of Kodame, co-founding it with Bruno, and celebrating art and technology in San Francisco right now, it's just really exciting to see all of the excitement around it. It's just like a shared thing for me. So it's just like nice to connect to people around something that I love. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm Bruno. I, um, I have to say I'm more of a tech side. It's, I'm a tech person that appreciates art. And um, yes, I've been a coder myself all my life and building software for artists, for designers. And that's been my passion. And uh, when I came to San Francisco, I started connecting with uh, Jordan. Um, I felt it was the best place to get this uh, happening, considering San Francisco is the hub for tech. And I, didn't, I have to admit, I didn't see as much as uh, art scene or struggling uh, here. And we felt, I felt that it would be, why, you know, this would be the hub and uh, the right place to bring the art and technology together. And um, yeah, we're excited to be here and uh, learn more about the rest. Uh, I'm Ian Heisters. I'm an independent artist. I run a small studio. Uh, and I work mostly in new media, digital media, and dance, um, and various performance. Uh, I started getting a degree in dance, and then uh, because I figured that programming would never make me any money. Uh, and then ended up getting a double major with computer science and dance. Uh, and in moving, I moved out to San Francisco because it was like a quiet backwater and nobody was here in like 2005. It was after the first boom and the second one hadn't quite started yet. So I figured, uh, and there was a huge dance community, so I figured it was a great place to um, have an art career rather than New York, which seemed a little bit uh, hard boiled for me at the time. Um, and then things changed a little bit. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I've been working with a variety of tech firms, um, both like startups, but also uh, institutions, nonprofits, and agencies, um, collaborating on creative projects um, in order to, I mean, won't mince words, to fund my arts practice because it seems to be uh, a more effective way than uh, doing a lot of grant funding or more traditional arts funding models. I'm Adam. Um, I'm trained as a musician, and I'm the co-founder of a place called the Center for New Music. Uh, we have a facility, we're an artist support organization focusing on building community for new music, uh, mostly here in San Francisco. We have a facility on Taylor Street near 6th and Market, so we're right in the middle of all of the Central Market uh, redevelopment. We're neighbors with many big tech companies uh, who have moved into the city. And as a result, um, we've had the opportunity to meet and talk and work with uh, a bunch of those representatives from Tech Corporation, so that's the experience that I'm hoping to uh, share with you all today. Um, in particular, we have an ongoing partnership with Spotify, who has an office right across the street from us. If you all know the Warfield, which is at 6th and Market, Spotify's upstairs. They have uh, two floors there. Um, so it's been a fascinating ride, and, and for me, which I think maybe is a, a bit in contrast to the other folks on the panel here, um, my own creative work as a composer it doesn't use digital tools at all. Um, I mostly write for acoustic instruments. Um, the music that we present at Center for New Music, it varies everything from conservatory trained kids to people on laptops and doing a lot more electronic uh, music and using technological tools. So it's a pretty wide range. Um, and I think 
one of the interesting things that we can explore more about is that relationship between your work and the people who are, you're doing it with and uh, you know where the interest overlaps. Sometimes it's really direct and sometimes it makes perfect sense with the tools and other times it's just about the people and um, making a personal connection. So um, thanks for having me. I'm yeah. excited to explore this. No, absolutely. So I, what I want to, I, I want to hear your thoughts around um, to sort of the current state of like tech versus art. And you said, Ian, a really interesting point. That's like it's a very interesting time right now in our city. Um, and it was a sleepy town in 2005 because I moved here in 2004. Um, so I, I remember um, that time. But what do you think that re that that relationship of tech and art is, and how do you see it evolving in San Francisco? Yeah, we do hear a lot of art versus tech yes. um, rhetoric, but one of the things that Kodame really shoots for is being more of a bridge between the sides and making it the art and tech kind of thing. Um, and for us, it's about finding the value on both sides, like for artists, like teaching them the value of technology or giving them access to technology. And from the technology side, like teaching them the value of art. Because um, the, the hardest thing is to sell something to somebody who doesn't see the value of it. So if you can, um, expose the value of art to somebody who doesn't otherwise value it, that's where like the key happens, the excitement happens, the magic happens. So that's kind of our, our goal, is bringing the two together. Yeah, and we see the, uh, we really rather see the technology as a tool for an artist mm -hmm. to explore. I mean, as artists use all different tools, uh, why not use technology, leveraging technology uh, as another tool uh, for the, to produce art? Yeah, I think, um, and thinking about that tech versus art, being in both worlds very frequently myself, I think it's it's problematic to create a monolith of tech in the city. There's a lot of tech. There's been I was just on a panel last weekend with the guy that invented MEMS technology in 1962 at UC Berkeley, and this is this like miniaturization process that gives like enables the sensors that I use in my art today. Uh, so like. There's that kind of academic tech that's been in the Bay Area since as long as UC Berkeley's been there. Uh, and and then there's there's nonprofits like Adam's nonprofit. I mean, you're not a tech nonprofit like Kodame or Bay Area Foundation of the Arts, but there's still a lot of people that are working with technology at your organization. Um, and then there's agencies that are doing creative work with technology. And then there's like what we think of as tech, we're thinking of like venture-backed startups. Uh, and I think there, like, if we talk about that very specifically, there's, there's problems in uh, both the way that they interact with the culture in San Francisco and also how they interact with artists. Um, and, and I think that's just kind of, I've personally, I've kind of given up on dealing with that issue. I think it's just endemic to the funding model and the organizational model of these corporations. Uh, and I'm not sure that it can be overcome. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think um, to put a finer a tool on that, like we we're talking about the time frames and how things have shifted in San Francisco, and I do think there's a huge difference for me in tech that was here 10 years ago as opposed to now, largely because that venture back tech was here 10 years ago, but we didn't have Google and Apple as the huge money machines that they are now. And so part of what I see is that as big companies, you know, with presence in San Francisco, Google, Apple, Salesforce, you know, some of these huge ones that employ a lot of people, the them being tech firms doesn't necessarily mean they have a lot of super creative tech people working for them. They have huge ad departments, they have huge marketing departments, you know, graphic design is enormous at Apple. Um, and so as those companies have matured, I think, you know, the, the money works a little bit differently. Like, uh, I remember very clearly, um, like, late 90s, tech parties, you know, startup parties was a certain kind of thing, right? And that, that spirit, that sort of Electronic Frontier Foundation, open source kind of spirit was far more pervasive than it is now. Because now the, mo the flow of the money isn't just venture money and then maybe we'll see what happens. It's like there's a very clear path from venture money to you know, IPO or getting bought out by even Facebook too. Um, and so I think the nature of the, the, the people who are working for those tech firms, um, it's more like, I think of it as closer to um, some of the big corporations who have been in San Francisco 
for years and years, like your Wells Fargo's, um, your Kaiser's, you know, those companies are also technically um, technology firms, like they have a lot of important technology that helps run their business, and the way that we interact with them from the nonprofit side is really similar. Like, you know, Apple's programs for interacting with artists are a lot like Wells Fargo's programs for interacting with artists. Um, it's, it's a specific thing, like the venture capital based back tech firms, you know, they do have a lot of cultural problems, but then as those, what used to be venture firms 10 years ago, have grown into big companies, um, they sort of just behave like any little corporation, I think, now. Yeah, what's well, uh, interesting, what are your cultural problems that you, uh, you said you're, you don't know where to fight? <laughs> well, I think, um, I, I mean, I agree with Adam that there is this transformation as a, as a company becomes bigger and has more disposable resources. Um, but I think the culture that's created in that early stage company of just like everything going towards creating a product and proving it right or wrong, there's no room there for, I mean, ostensibly it's all built for experimentation, but not like real artistic experimentation where there's not the like feel good kind of uh, risky and fall forward kind of stuff, but like real failure yeah, uh, I, that's I, necessary to create room. Agree. And that and that culture is carried forward into like the Googles and the Apples. They have more room for experimentation, but they still have that culture that I think, for instance, like when they create artistic residencies, their uh, intellectual property around the output of the residency is really problematic because they have these really um, IP strict cultures. That's true. So One I, of the things that we've done to work around the IP issue is that we will do projects and workshops with the corporations that specifically don't apply to their core competency or mm -hmm. their products, like things that get the workers kind of out of their bubbles and creating in new spaces, and that's helped with that a little bit. Yeah. But it's true, so I think uh, companies now, startups, or even big companies with big more assets, they're so focused on the product, they're so, um, there's so much pressure so much competition, but they really get blind sometimes on what the opportunities can can happen if you think out of the box and, and, and work with artists. I, I think you're right. I mean, I think that's uh, they're missing out on an opportunity. And probably one of the reasons actually um, companies made it back in the days uh, where the culture was different, <coughs> that's where we are right now, we're successful. I, I've been thinking a lot about like if we, if the companies, if the culture continues this way long term, Will Silicon Valley be what Silicon Valley is nowadays? Um, I, I totally agree. It's uh, it's uh, it's a cultural. Uh, I I'm, I mean I hope that through Kodam and people like us, uh, we able to um, educate and, and you know see the value and uh, enable these companies um, to uh, to adopt artists an opportunity to explore, think out of the box. But it's it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a challenge, no question. And from the company perspective, because I work at a company, I feel that for me, it, it the obviously we are in the creative sector, so it becomes really easy for us to sponsor things like the start of art fair or think about you know, division or other like nonprofits and kind of partner. And because I worked in art arts nonprofit, I kind of see the connections. But um, I have sometimes a hard time advocating for these partnerships within my organization as someone who believes that the art and tech, and tech belong together and working for a company that is actually about creativity, um, right? Because I'm, I say instead of spending the money sponsoring Coachella, can we do something locally? Um, and so I'm thinking about these things, but do you, as artists or even myself, do you think that there's ways of talking to technology people that can help bridge that or that can help you know, for me, going to a VP and selling this partnerships, it's, it's a lot of work at times. Um, and I'm glad that I've worked with partners that have been like, okay, well, we can talk about this and we can talk about users. And, and, and so I think that there's a, a speaking their language. Um, do you have experience doing that or advice or just sort of can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, there's several angles you can mm -hmm. take there. And, um, it's just kind of finding little ways for art to flourish in the changing landscape because granted the landscape will always change um, so it's just like looking at where things are at and finding the right ways to say it um, you know finding CMOs the marketing officers are usually the ones who can say yes to stuff so finding avenues to them um, and 
then also like talent people, like people who are interested in talent because we've been successful running workshops and um, off-sites, things like that. Talent people are also usually interested in finding where the, uh, the, the overlap makes sense. But you're right, I mean, yeah, you need to talk their language. So it's not just about, uh, it's this intersection, you know, finding the intersection between art and technology. And they do understand certain terms. Mm -hmm. They're used to the, those terms and uh, it's easier to uh, engage if you talk their language. Um, the other way that uh, we are successful, the way we, we build things, we, we, we build experiences and we invite people, even not even directly, they come, they see the explore, they get inspired and they go back to the, the company and say, hey, we need to do something with this artist. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's uh, also been very successful. Mm. They come to us, we don't go to them and ask for, can you uh, work with us? They, they call us, they, hey, I want, then it's a matter of us be able to ma handle um, the, the request, but uh, really it's the experience we show that we inspire then, and, and hopefully, I mean, that's our way to uh, break uh, that routine of the culture, yeah. because they all want to be uh, exploring, they all want to have uh, uh, amazing uh, experiences and they, and they get inspired. Um, and yeah, that's our way to break through, um, but directly. Uh, yeah, Bruno's <coughs> talking about the events that we run um, for a while. We were doing like monthly salons and mm -hmm. are bringing that back, and then our yearly festival and just like places for people to explore and experience art and get inspired. Yeah. So events help a lot. Okay, well, and I think that relates to something that I've been working on recently. I've had better traction with it at academic institutions, mm -hmm. but. Um, because, particularly for tech artists, so much of our work is around research, um, whether it's cultural research or technological research. Um, where there is commonality, uh, like I've done some stuff with Intel where they're working on a new sensor or a new chip, and if they, I mean, it's not, at a, it's not a very like well-meshed partnership, it's just like they will give me free hardware and free code, and I can play with it. Um, and I, but I think that's the beginning of something um, where, you know, a better, a more <coughs> deeper relationship is like I have with UC Berkeley where I'm on working groups because I'm working on the same research that they're working on. We can share notes and we can agree that all the outcome of it is open source uh, so that we're all helping each other. Um, and that becomes a really interesting way for the arts to be partnering with these organizations. It's interesting you say that it's, the beginning of something like I, th I feel like that's <clears throat> that's really at the at the core of what can make these relationships work if is if both parties agree that this could be the beginning of something um, like when I think about traditional corporate philanthropy like the example I always bring up is like Stern Grove summer events that happen if you haven't been to them you should definitely go to them they're awesome free concerts you know thousands of people great music you know, Wells Fargo loves to give money to that because it's thousands of people, it's free, it reaches so many people in San Francisco. It's just a numbers game, right? And in that game, independent artists can never win because you're one person, and how can you make a pitch to a corporation like that? But I think the real potential with tech companies is that the people who are working there are there because they love this feeling <coughs> of like, here's this creative thing, and we're, we're starting a new yeah. thing, it's got so much potential. Mm -hmm. And so if you can find a way to capture that feeling and be willing to put in the hard work of like taking wrong steps or taking one step and backing up and then talking about it again. You know, tech people, as you know, and design people are so iterative with their process. You just, I feel like you really have to be willing to do that thing. But and in a way, it's like cultivating a different type of donor, right? Like for anyone that's worked in development for nonprofits, like you're, but you're sort of cultivating a different type of donor. Yeah. That's yeah. hard because you have to yeah. be, you have to know that that's part of your process. Like mm -hmm. that's the other thing. It's a lot like going for a grant. Like you really have, to, I find with our organization, we have to do a lot of reflection about, you know, is this an activity that we really have the capacity to do? Is it something that hits our mission that we would do anyways? Mm -hmm. Because they're, especially in the central market area, like there's um, six companies who as part of their um, tax forgiveness have to give back to the community in some way. So that's like Twitter, Zendesk, Spotify is one of them, there's a few others. Um, but what they want, you know, what they want from the inside tends to be the kind of political cover type stuff, like 
we want to help education, you know, we want to do community health. It's not like they're dying to support experimental music. Uh, <laughs> definitely not. So, you know, for us, that's been a really interesting conversation of like, well, where, where can we overlap? Like, I don't want to go out of our way and force musicians, you know, to go out onto the street and play where people don't respect the music and respect what they're doing. Yeah. And I think as, as an artist, that's always the question. It's like, is this putting me out of what I really want to do? Or is this, you know, is there a way that what they want and what I want can work together and create something? And there's definitely a fine, a fine balance. I think that there has to be the right partnership and you don't have to compromise your work or your integrity to have you know, this like a tech partnership. And I mean, even from the company end, I definitely w wouldn't want to partner with someone who I'm forcing them to do something super cheesy for fixed art. Like I definitely don't want that. I, I, we're nimble as well. And in our experience, we are pretty uh, happy with that relationship. They, uh, it's like an, an agency you you are forced to be uh, uh, following what the customer really is after. But when uh, you bring art together in, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in collaboration with a company, they hardly tell you what to do. They respect. That's what is nice about um, having art rather than actually a project for an agency, <coughs> is that there's a really, really high respect of freedom given to the artist. Um, and I mean, yes, there's a lower budget. It's not as big as an agency, uh, but at least you know there's a freedom, and, and both parties are happy. It usually comes from the companies seeing the artist's work and wanting to engage with them and being excited to even meet them and like see what their process is and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it, there is like a, the sense of respect that we've seen. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I'm glad that you've had those kinds of experiences with companies. I think. One reason I like research-based partnerships as opposed to like working with a CMO, usually like it seems like these projects want like a lot of impact and marketing yeah. potential, even if it's, even if they will give you a lot of creative freedom. Um, it depends on you as an artist and like whether what you're doing fits with what they're already doing, if they're going to give you that freedom. For people that are working more experimental uh Areas I'm thinking of a lot of the musicians at Adam's place. That's not as feasible So like a research partnership allows you like okay, we can agree on this. We both want this new kind of sensor We both want this new kind of camera. We don't have to match up on the aesthetic parameters mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, but in, in our case our uh, uh, Like uh, like uh, Jordan was saying I want to uh, learn as well about the process how you use certain tools how you get to that point just inspi be inspired and not necessarily, yeah, you're right. I mean, you don't want to be, some, in some cases, like especially the big tech companies, especially the big ones, they're very careful. Put their name next to something. Yeah, yeah. Um, because, yeah, for many reasons. Uh, but there are, you know, other aspects that you can work with and not necessarily the, uh, the big marketing company. Yeah. And that's not, yeah, no, definitely not. And I'd, I'd love actually to hear more about like Spotify and the work that how you got them in, involved with you, but also I, if you guys have examples of successful partnerships that you've done, I'd love to hear some about that. Sure. Um, just briefly, the history with Spotify, because we're neighbors, um, it just kind of made sense. And I will say, I think the thing that's helped us establish this relationship with Spotify was there was one person in their office mm -hmm. who was tasked with helping set up the community relationships and making sure they're fulfilling their community benefit agreement. And I find that's often the case with big companies. Um, there's always gonna be one person. Uh, like I was talking to a friend who works at YouTube. They have a YouTube for good. Um, it's kind of a one person thing. Like he's working internally to try to grow that group of people who are really interested in leveraging YouTube towards social impact. Um, but it's about, partially it's about finding that one person. So for us that started early. And that was a relationship that I just kept working on, uh, trying to find a good program for us to you know, use their money on, essentially. So we started like with a young artist workshop, because um, we had some members who wanted to do that who were guitarists, and they offered a great workshop. Um, for us, it, it wasn't super successful. We don't do a lot of education, so it was like targeting uh, an age range that we felt was good for us. It was an 18 to 24 age range, and, and that's really the you know, we focused a lot on supporting emerging artists, so that worked for us. Uh, but the particular thing wasn't great, so we kind of went back to the drawing board in the second year, um, which just started a few months ago, and Spotify offered, or of the many things we offered them, Spotify said they would support uh, interns for us. 
So we have so many concerts happening at our place that um, we always need help running the shows, interacting with the artists, and basically, um, you know, it was this need that we had because we're a nonprofit, we don't have a lot of money, so we need human resource support to make this thing go. Um, Spotify, I love that it still hit the same age range because we could focus on 18 to 24, we could focus on recruiting people from the neighborhood, um, and we were giving them skills in video and audio production that are like relevant to what Spotify does. Um, so the other part for them was they really wanted to get their employees engaged in the neighborhood, so it's, it sort of teed up this thing that we're still developing of uh, giving our interns the opportunity to go over there and meet the Spotify employees, many of whom have background in recording studios or working for labels, and so there's a nice sort of exchange of information that's going on there. And you know, the interesting thing about that is like, sure, Spotify is a tech company, but what we're doing together, it doesn't have a lot to do with being a tech company yeah. or the coding. You know, the coding is like way beyond the capacity of what anyone really cares about in our space, like optimizing the, the music referral algorithm or filling in the ads or whatever, like who cares about that? Uh, but the thing that is um, a commonality for us is everyone cares about music. And so that's what made the, the partnership sort of go from the beginning and continue to now, is that we knew that we're all in this because we enjoy music, we love learning about new music, um, we want to support musicians, and so those core things, you know, there are some like other issues that we could talk about, about how musicians feel about Spotify in general, <laughs> but, um, you know, as a starting place, it was a great place to start, so now we're doing this internship thing, and, you know, we'll see where the partnership goes, um, but it's been a lot of back and forth to just sort of figure out what was going to work. Okay. Yeah, there's definitely that sort of back and forth, and, and I think it's, it's good for artists and both for organizations to find what, what works. Like if you're in music, to find another music app or, because at least there's some sort of like commonality, um, at least for Pixar, because we are a creativity tool and we are, you know, a place for creative and artists, like visual arts is sort of like the nature, natural place for, for us to do and sponsor. Yeah, I, think, I think what you said, like, is uh, you need mm -hmm. one person in the company yeah. that is really passionate mm -hmm. and very focused on that particular area. That person makes a big difference. You, you cannot just um, generally approach or uh, work with uh, a company unless there is that one person. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that one comes back to relationships. It's just all about relationships and developing them. To your point about developing donors, that's really what it is. Yeah. yeah um, like to pivot a little bit. Sure. Because it's great to hear about organizational and institutional architect. But one of the things that's worth noting is if you go to these installations here, how little tech there is and how little it percolates down. And if you look at Europe, how far behind we are in mm -hmm. art and tech interactions and, and sheer art in Europe. Support and awareness and I don't see it in the galleries. I don't see it, you know, what's going to be shown in SF moments sort of high cultural art. And probably very little experimental. And if we don't have a festival like San Jose's. Uh, Zero, Zero, Zero one. one. Yeah. yeah. Which is, uh, so the question is how do we generate that? Where's a website that shows technicians? You know, I'm always looking for hardware tech, you know, who's interested in art. I could care less about going on the two institutions organizations. I find restricted and they're thinking inside boxes I'm going to move beyond they're trying to. So my question to you guys is, you know, how how where how can individual artists, you know, not necessarily depend on institutions or organizations, how can they get connected with hardware, tech, and, I don't know, coders? Yeah, people? honestly the um the hardware sponsorships are one of the easiest things to work out if you come at a company with a proposal of like Here's my idea. I could use your technology. They're usually willing to give you some yeah, but hardware. You keep going to this corporate model. Yeah, no, wait. I, I look, yeah. Please. Yeah. What I'm really looking for is I'm looking for that guy who's great at taking apart a camera and putting it back together and projection technology stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, there's really interesting hardware startups and I, you know, who want to play a little bit. So I'm a little bit wary about going to CMOs and all this stuff. You know, they don't really. You know, they're, they're not going where I'm going because of the impact issue. Or, you know, what are they getting out of it? Whereas somebody, a hardware tech, he's just, oh, that's kind of fun. Let's play with that. We're willing to experiment. Do you look for more like a, a partner who understands technology and wants to play with you with exactly. ideas? Exactly. 
Yeah. I wish there was a website that says, hey, you know, here's somebody who is kind of playing with stuff, and I want, you know, I'm interested, I'm open to doing no, no, okay. meetups, and maybe your salons. Yeah, that's what I'm about to say. It's like that's what we, we are about. Uh, we, we have a lab, and we bring we bring projects, and people are interested in building and exporting, and we try to have these projects supported by companies. No, it doesn't have to be that way. You know, we can support it ourselves. We have budget that we actually supported this project yeah, ourselves, yeah. um, and uh, that's the whole goal. I mean, it's um, it's um, having this lab to then uh, build project to be showcased at a festival. The good news is that San Francisco has an art and tech festival. Uh, we run one every year. Um, and it's, uh, this year's gonna be the biggest one we ever done. Um, we usually have 5,000 people coming to our festival. This year we are going for Mason. We have my, uh, like 10,000 people joining. So yeah, that is, yeah that's how really exa exactly what we are doing is what you, I believe what you're looking for. Oh, Kodame. Kodame Art and Tech. Little stickers here. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Uh, Do you have an exchange? So you go there, explain the process, somebody watches it, so you know, and then, then coming back. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we have di different events, but um, the festival will be created, will be, we select the projects, but the lab is the opportunity to. Connect with other people. Connect other people and, and uh, get the equipment necessary. Propose a project. Find another either a coder, an artist, uh, or um, troubleshooter. You know anybody that actually can help in the uh, you need in the, in the uh, for your project. Yeah, share your ideas and see if it resonates with anybody. And yeah, cool. I, I maybe we should so. do a be better job to uh, let people know about. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's a really interesting question. Like for me, it, it really hits on this. Um, socioeconomic issue of social connection because, okay, so I was an undergrad at Stanford, right? One of the great things, the great privileges of being an undergrad at Stanford is when I talk to friends, there's so many of them who are working at these tech companies. It makes it really easy for me to socially hunt somebody down. So like, hey, maybe I want to find someone who is an engineer at Dolby working on their new MP3 algorithm, right? It's a little bit easier for me to do that than for somebody else to do that. And unfortunately, you know, what applies you know, thinking about the artists who are here, the same thing that applies to trying to sell a piece of art applies to cultivating support for hardware, cultivating support for marketing support, you know, for free studio space, for whatever it is that you feel like you need. It still falls to that same old thing. It's like, who do you know? Who can you leverage a good relationship into? Um, and there aren't a lot of platforms that are built to create equitable access to those opportunities because, like Ian said, I think, those opportunities are often so unstructured. I mean, that was one of the big things about Spotify that kind of stunned me. Um, I knew that they were obligated to give a certain amount through community benefit, but I walk in there and there's no, like, no theory on how they're gonna do this. You know, they have not thought about philanthropy. They're just starting to talk about social impact and what that means. And so that is not baked in the way it is for like lawyers for the arts or architects who are willing to give pro bono or, you know, there's a bunch of other fields that have been around for a long time and they're used to giving and they have systems for giving. So unfortunately, I think, you know, the answer to the question, which is a little depressing, um, is it's a hustle. It's just the hustle, just like selling pieces, just like getting shows um, and sort of getting an idea of what you're after and just hunting that person down and hopefully you'll like that person and sometimes even if you don't, you gotta take them out for drinks anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think you uh, get it. Something that I often I've been finding myself wishing for as an artist is like, because I'm always going to these companies. Like, you know, oftentimes I start through a technical channel because that's where I find people that get the value of what I'm doing. Um, and I have to explain the whole thing from the ground up about how a partnership would work and how hardware loans would work, and and what it would look like and why they would do it. And if and if there was a more established framework around that, like there is for artist residencies, uh, they wouldn't look at me like I was crazy. Like we're gonna give, you, we're gonna pay you to play with our free hardware. What? Um, like imagine the first person who went to Recology and was like, "Can I be an artist at the dump?" Yeah. And like those people are gonna be like, "Yeah, what are you talking about?" Yeah. But now it's program. Yeah. Exactly. And unfortunately, there's a lot of like teams of one with at the other end, you know, and the companies like 
corporate social responsibility at Yahoo, which is one of the biggest uh, programs there are, and just because I worked briefly at Yahoo, was three people. Yeah. That's three people. That's it. So, and they were pretty much doing what they had done before. One of them had worked in education, so a lot of the yeah. budget for Yahoo went to education because that what she, that's what she worked in before. And that's what she knew, and that's where she had her contract, her contact. So it wasn't like she didn't want to help artists. It's just she didn't know how to. And artists weren't coming to her. And and, and it is a lot of work because you do have to come up with like very carefully stated proposals of what you're gonna do and what the company's getting or what you're getting or what another artist or a coder is getting for what you're giving them. So it is a hustle and it's not easy and it's definitely not easy for either end. Um, because it is true, like your CMO, I have to make a case for partnerships that I want to that I want to do. I had to be like, oh, the startup art fair, they have this many people that are coming there every day. They're gonna look at our app, they're gonna see it, they're gonna know about us, and I have to make a case for it. I'm passionate about art, um, and it's a clear partnership, but not everyone is, and the person in the company or even the coder might not feel like, oh, I can I can relate to an artist, and it's sort of a, an education. Yeah. For both ends. At the same time, I mean, I think the the encouraging thing about it, though, is coming up with that proposal yeah. really does leverage what I think artists are, are really good at. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have this, um, you know, freedom to define the relationship in yeah. a way that can be creative and fun and inspiring or, you know, could lead to a lot of interesting questions. Um, you know, those are things that artists are so good at. So, in a way, that plays to strengths. Um, it's just a matter of like being willing to put the time in to put your creative energy there as opposed to your usual practice. I think <clears throat> coming from the artist side, like precedents like this fair and you sponsoring or working with this fair are super helpful because then we, we can point at that and say, look, they did it and it worked out for them. Or this project here, that was a residency with this artist and it worked out great. That model does help us with Kodami as well. We have our kind of case studies of projects that have gone well that we introduce to companies as we're approaching them and show them that this is something that we've succeeded at previously and that there is value on both ends. Yeah, it also helps to have uh, hundreds of artists and projects you know, we're, that we've been working with. And when we talk to these companies, we say we ask what they're looking for, what areas they would like to explore. We have sort of a catalog that we can show to them and they get inspired by one or the other. And then and the conversation starts. Like like you said, you need to make a proposal. You cannot just say, let's do this thing. No, yeah. this is the proposal. We actually mm -hmm. have, a, we can build a project together, you can, we can do a workshop together, we can do a, we can teach your team, or you can have an event uh, yeah. and expose, uh, you, you know, give back uh, kudos to you, but having this project to be exposed in an event. And by the way, people are really helpful. I Googled Art and Tech and messaged him on LinkedIn. <laughs> and he called out, he's here, like, <laughs> partnership right there. That's how it happens. You just like pick someone that you're interested in, email them, ask them out for coffee. The yeah. worst that can happen is they say no. You already had the no, on to the next one. Yeah. I get blamed people never met emailing me all the time. Just, yeah. It works great. Sometimes I totally say yes and then put a bunch of time to their project. Yeah. Yeah. Bruno touched on something that I think is really interesting is that collectivization, like the fact that you have so many artists that you can sort of offer. And f you know, for Center for New Music, that's been a real key also. Um, you know, a <coughs> for us, we kind of felt like the experimental music scene was so diffuse that that was one of our main roles, was to integrate and be able to present a more united front. Um, and so I think you know, that's an old tactic for artists, right? Is like having a collective so you can do group shows, so you can afford studio space, um, so you can share resources, that kind of thing. And I think that's that's one that will never go out of style. Um, it's just sort of, you know, to channel the warriors, it's a strength in numbers thing. I'm actually, uh, no, it was actually uh, your question about like, why don't I see much art and tech in these, uh, these events? Um, I was also the, uh, for Mason, uh, and there was not much there either. Um, but the reality is, it's tough, it's pretty hard. Installations are not easy to build, to maintain. Uh, it needs a lot of uh, labor, uh, love, uh, and uh, knowledge. And money. and money, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but when they actually are there, and this art interacts with you, and um, people are amazed and inspired, uh, but it's, it's a lot of work. I wish one of these companies in the market 
with an open gallery, showing music, showing performance, showing new kinds of uh, mixed media art. There is one, uh, what's it called, Pace in the Mellow Park. Oh, there's two Pace. Yeah, two Pace galleries, one, yeah. galleries. One in New York and one here. Or there's one, one in, in Menlo Park and then on Tuesday, Palo Alto and something. So, yeah, right, right, right. Mm. so they're doing there a lot of, uh, well, we actually have been doing for uh, many years, but in a real uh, gallery space. Pace is one of the big topics. Yeah. And they have clearly their own agenda of selling better signs. Because that, that's what they make them out of. They're doing a little bit of experimental stuff. But I think we need somebody who's going to take big chances and show dance and show music and show art. Because I think without that public display, we're not going to get to a tipping point. We are way beyond the curve. Just of awareness. Uh, that's, a, that's a bigger thing. I mean, yeah, that's like, yeah, there's just culturally and governmentally, politically, there's a whole different arts culture here and I mean I think one interesting thing is here we have art and tech it's like a subgenre it's becoming a subgenre I feel like the work you guys have done is great and like gray area is done is great but it creates a stronger identity around art and tech as opposed to it just being like a a thing that's there in art you know and um, I think it's it's been I'm not sure why but it has a, it creates a different uh, environment working as an artist here as opposed to in Europe. Oh, definitely. Like you said, in Europe or Canada, they have a lot of grant, I mean, they have a, yeah, government support that supports this sort of initiatives. And, yeah. Um, it's, it's a different, yeah, different. You know, I hate to be dull from the audience, there were some people who talked, but, you know, I think there's actually an opportunity to push the San Francisco Art Commission to do that gallery, do that support. Because Ed Lee, if nothing else, is very integrated with the art, with the, with the tech community, and he's willing to take chances, particularly if it has some impact. So maybe there's an opportunity to talk to those people about maybe putting a program into the galleries they have now. And I, I have to say, I see more and more. Uh, and then throughout the years, I'm seeing more museum having, not entirely, not, you know, a groundbreaking uh, things, but I, I start to see more uh, installations that are more interactive. Maybe towards the kids, um, educational, but at least at least there is uh, there is more happening, and not but yeah, but you're right. There could be way more. And I love all the points you're bringing, but I, I almost feel like some of them are part of a different conversation because like I can't tell you what the arts commission is gonna do or not do or how they're gonna fund or even just how ahead of the curve Europe is versus like the U.S. It's kind of like an unfortunate. Uh, fact, but they do have a lot of government support uh, that we don't have, and I, I personally can't change the way that the government funds arts. Although I'm trying by you know being an advocate, <laughs> which you should too. Vote, um, <laughs> and make sure that your vote counts, and talk to your uh, assemblyman and tell them that art is important. Um, but I'll just I want to close things up and see if anyone in the audience has like a question or a comment or yes. Um, could you guys give us some examples of? how your art directly may have influenced um, the design of some of your two partners. And um, uh, how, how your, your art, your, your, your creative uh, influence directly designed uh, some of your tech partners, and um, how you make that argument you know, to, to future tech partners. Uh, so it's like a product, yeah. like, you know, your, your art directly is influenced a product they create, the service they create. Mm. The way it's, I mean, uh, just personally, uh, I love what I do at Colorman and the exposure I get with artists and, and building things with them because I go back to work and I'm inspired, I got the passion, and even if directly, maybe there is no a direct correlation with what I do, but just uh, be able to think about the box, be inspired, being passionate about, brings it back to the, I believe in you know, the people I work with, in the company, and influence the product. After all, I push the boundaries as I work as well. Um, and most of the time, it, like I said, we're not targeting directly working with the core competencies of a company. We're usually trying to work on a project outside of that space. Um, 
mostly, well, for a few reasons, but because the people that are working on these things day in and day out, they're already kind of bored with them and have a way of approaching them. So getting outside of that already opens up their minds a little bit. And then also because it does kind of get away from the intellectual property stuff. Like if they were paying us to work directly on their product, it puts them in the mindset of like, okay, here's our goals and we have to go through these iterations of reviews and stuff rather than having like a, a more open-ended, fun collaboration. But it's a good question because um, it's an indirect impact. It's hard to measure. It's not something that you can say, okay, if I work, we have a res an art residency in my, or I work with Kodame, uh, do I generate, you know, my design works, it improves, or my, my product improves. It's not, and it should not be, cannot be a direct, as hard to measure. It's more um, a cultural, we are talking initially, impact, uh, inspirational, be able to think outside the box, all these values that unfortunately they're very hard to measure. Uh, For to us, actually, we have, like, our app um, has like a drawing portion of it, and we've had artists draw using our app and give us feedback that mm -hmm. has directly influenced what our product, how our product is evolving now and what the tools are like. For example, like our brushes don't really function as brushes right now, um, and we've had artists tell us that. And for me, going to a product manager and saying like, so a community member X, Things that the brushes aren't great is then isn't as impactful as being so we hosted a conversation with artists and the artists played with the app and they said that the brushes do not behave like brushes and here's their feedback then the product can say okay now it's our priority to rebuild our brushes um, which is something that we're working on right now we're like redoing a lot of our editor because of feedback that we've gotten and the more if we have a professional artist giving our feedback it sort of like makes the feedback legitimate for us um, because it's not just me and my instinct and saying something I can say hey this person said that and I'm you know not all tech companies have something so direct yeah, like yeah. for us it's just like it's a product that's direct with artists but for products that are direct then you can actually see the impact pretty, pretty quickly. I think my relationship has been similarly direct uh, where you know I'll actually write like a new algorithm for their camera or something like that or optimize something or be reporting uh, issues with their product because I tend to push products way past what general consumers do uh, but that's good for them because they need to it helps them learn the boundaries of their product even they say okay we're not gonna go that far uh, it's still good to know what it can do at that edge um. Speaking on behalf of, uh, there's been so many examples in the, mus the new music community um, that have to do with um, sound disbursement in the space, like acoustic reinforcement, that kind of thing, or even um, algorithms for music encoding, you know, so that you can stream more efficiently, or trying, you know, more recently, like the technology to provide low latency so that I could, you know, play in a band with someone who's in New York and we would be able to coordinate. Um, but I think, you know, there's still some really exciting stuff, especially in the interface controller space right now. Um, there's really exciting work going on with like uh, neurotransmitter controllers. And a lot of that uh, work is happening in games. So we're talking about like, you know, you put on the cap and then you can move things around on the screen, but then the conversations that the game makers are having with the audio people about, you know, how does that affect the audio spatialization and how can we compose for that kind of situation? Um, I don't know if any of you played like that, that app that Bjork made with the, you know, the... Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's that kind of stuff. I think there are areas there where, um, where, you know, the interface between the user and the creator and the fact that those projects have creators baked into their teams. You know, there's always someone with games who's composing. Um, there's always someone with apps who's, who's working on the sound in some way. Um, those are great opportunities, and there's a lot of really cool stuff happening there. Yeah. I think 